come show you. Okay, uh, hi, my name is Sergio Peste. I work at Microsoft, and tonight I'm going to give you an introduction to a distinct field of machine learning, which is called reinforcement learning. So what you see on my laptop screen right now are two examples of reinforcement learning. Two agents, autonomous agents, trying to work their way through solving a specific problem uh, simply by trial and error. Uh, on the left side you see a, an agent trying to get better and play the uh, quite familiar game Breakout, which is part of the suite of games uh, that came with the Atari 2600 console. Uh, and it's basically trying to accumulate points by uh, kicking, out, kicking down as many bricks as possible. And on the right side, you see a car, basically an agent that is trying to push a car uh, up a hill. So in this particular example on the right side, uh, what the agent is supposed to be figuring out is that uh, it's supposed to be pushing the car uh, up to the uh, hill on the left and then gain some momentum so the car can actually make it over the, the hill because the agent itself cannot push the car by sheer uh, brute force uh, on the top of the hill. Uh, you may also notice that both of my agents right now are kind of bad at what they're trying to do. But, you know, that's okay. That's, in a way, that's kind of how we humans learn. We start by trying out new things, and we, st we start by being bad at them. But eventually, with experience, we get better and better. And that's kind of the essence of reinforcement learning. <coughs> uh, by the way, I've already uploaded my slides, and I've posted a link on the uh, Meetup page with the, uh, where you can actually find the slides. So, what is reinforcement learning? You can use a kind of formal definition coming straight from the uh, most important book in the field, I would say, uh, Reinforcement Learning and Introduction by Richard Sutton and, and uh, Andy Barco. Uh, second edition is about to be out, I think, this year. Uh, reinforcement learning is basically learning what to do, essentially how to map situations to action, so to man maximize a numerical reward signal. So you get a sort of reward for doing the right thing. And what's crucial about reinforcement learning, like you saw in my examples before that, is that the, the learner is not told a priori what, which actions to take in a specific situation, but instead must discover which actions lead to that reward, the best possible reward, by trial and error. So in a way, reinforcement learning is about learning the way humans do, the way you might uh, the way a child might learn how to build a tower out of cubes. Now, that child might actually get uh, human, uh, uh, say, adult help and tutoring, or they may not. But that's kind of a next level discussion here. But the main idea is trial and error. So I've seen a bit. Uh, I've seen some questions coming in onto the meetup uh, uh, sign-up form about what, where does the reinforcement learning lie? on the spectrum of machine learning and what's the difference between that and deep learning. Reinforcement learning is one type of approach that you can take in uh, solving problems with machine learning. Uh, it's kind of the same level as supervised learning, which basically uh, means that we have labeled data and then we use that data and their labels to train a machine learning uh, model, an algorithm and build a trained model, uh, which we can then use for things like classification, so image classifications, diagnostics, fraud detection, uh, and or regression, so predicting numbers instead of classes. So forecasting uh, and you know, things like that. So the main idea is with supervised learning, we have the label data, we have data and the outcome. With unsupervised learning, uh, we don't really have an outcome, we are basically just trying to discover patterns in the data. Right, so we may actually want to do uh, to segment that data uh, using something like whole clustering. Uh, reinforcement learning is, like I said, is a different approach than these two uh, in that it tries to learn by trial and error. It doesn't have a huge chunk of data at the beginning, um, and it's not necessarily trying to discover patterns uh, in the same way unsupervised learning it would, would, but can be used for quite a long list of tasks. <clears throat> and now, just because uh, it's different, uh, reinforcement learning is different than supervised learning, for example. That doesn't mean that we can't use supervised learning or supervised learning methods like deep learning, deep supervised learning, or unsupervised, deep unsupervised learning when doing reinforcement learning. And we're actually going to see an example. So 
they don't actually exclude each other. So applications of reinforcement learning, we already discussed the Atari um, uh, <coughs> agent that was uh, trained, uh, that was kind of uh, described in a kind of very important paper, uh, the Atari with deep reinforcement learning. So there were, there were a bunch of uh, games from the Atari 26 console series described there. So basically what's interesting here is that the agent doesn't really learn from any human induced knowledge. The agent basically just sees a bunch of pixels. They basically get a look at what the user would see. They get a look at the screen and they will get a sort of uh, push to optimize their scores. They will, they will get rewarded whenever they uh, increase their score. Um, it's been starting to be used in uh, locomotion behavior, behavior learning. So this is an example of a agent, autonomous agent that learns on its own to trial and error to run, walk, and then jump through, jump over obstacles. And in this case, you can imagine that the reward function is kind of a function of how far along the path the agent would be able to, to go. Uh, this is a, actually I think I skipped the slide. Two. Okay, so this is probably the most high profile example. Um, in 2015, a, an agent uh, called AlphaGo, uh, trained by uh, Mike, was able to defeat, uh, for the first time, it was able to defeat a grandmaster level go, human goal player in a match. Uh, it was Lisa Do, which you see over there looking very concerned. Uh, go was thought to be a game that was kind of hard for machines to master, just because uh, there is a lot of strategy involved and there is this huge state space, and uh, it's not very clear how, uh, what, how to proceed in a specific situation. Uh, but AlphaGo actually beat Lisa Do uh, four, game, three game, four games to one, 2015. Two years later, uh, an improved version of AlphaGo called AlphaGo Zero uh, was able to defeat the current world number one a Go player, uh, KJ from China, three games to nil. So basically, even KJ re recognized that at this point, computers have mastered, have bested humans in Go. Uh, what was interesting, the other thing that was interesting about AlphaGo Zero is that unlike the original AlphaGo, which had a database of grandmaster level games to learn from at the beginning, AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero learned to play Go completely from scratch. Simply trained and got better by playing against itself. And we can get back to that in a sec. Uh, it's not just Go, that kind of got conquered uh, by machines. Uh, this is uh, an example from last year where a AI, an AI agent was able to beat a one versus one, in a one versus one game, a human champion at Dota, Dota 2 games. The, uh, uh, team versus team uh, aspect is a bit more complex, hasn't happened yet, but... Okay. Uh, an AI, AI control sailplane, this is a project out of Microsoft's research. Uh, this is basically a sort of autopilot uh, for a, sail, a sailplane. Uh, but instead of a normal autopilot in a regular commercial plane, this autopilot learns to fly the sailplane by trial and error. First the simulator and then inside the real thing. I'm sure you can actually see the cell there. And there are quite a few other examples. I'm going to stop here for now. So just to formalize the problem of reinforcement learning a little bit. Uh, reinforcement learning is basically happens in a, uh, during a sequence of uh, interactions between two actors, an agent and an environment. The environment is basically the, uh, the one that defines the world that the agent is living in. It's basically representing to the agent, to the agent that's supposed to become intelligent, how the world looks like and how the world behaves. Right? So basically the environment uh, is able to accept action from the agent. So the agent will take an action, for example, like pushing that cart up the hill, and then it will compute the laws of that particular world, and then it will return to the agent uh, a new state, so basically once you push that part a little bit to the right, you are in the new state, and I will give you a reward as well. So this is basically the environment loop. Now, uh, if you try to use reinforcement learning for anything uh, in your field, you will probably need to have this environment coded for you, by you. But if you want to just start out with reinforcement learning, then you're likely, then you're likely going to want to start with some pre-built environments. And your first stop, honestly, should be the OpenAI Gym, which is a 
open, AI, open project from OpenAI containing a collection of already available environments that you can then use to try your hand at reinforcement learning. And there are environments for classic control programs like the mountain car that I showed uh, in the, uh, the beginning of the talk. Uh, there are all the Atari game environments. You can already guess that my demos were based on those OpenAI uh, environments. So all the games like Pong or Breakout, well not all of them, but most of them are available as environments. Uh, there is a physics engine with dynamics with contact uh, built in. So you can train, uh, define and train these types of um, uh, 3D agents that are uh, controllable by specific joints that you can then act on, like moving those joints or uh, pushing or things like that. And then you can train your agents to do whatever you want, like a cheetah trying to run or a humanoid trying to stand up and walk. Uh, there is a specific area around robotics, so you can have goal-based tasks for robots, things like you know, uh, picking and placing uh, uh, objects from one spot to another, rotating, handling, and uh, things like that. Uh, if you're into more more into autonomous driving, autonomous flying type of uh, things, uh, you may want to use a Microsoft AirSim, which is also an open source project that is basically a physics engine on top of the Unreal game engine that is able to interact with your agent uh, directly. So basically you're able to model specific types of vehicles, like you see here kind of a drone uh, or cars, and you, you'll be able to equip it with some types of sensors and cameras and things like that, and then the agent, the environment will be able to provide via an API uh, the state of the world, uh, you will be able to simulate the physics using the Unreal physics engine, and then you will be able to use the agent to basically try and error, try various actions and see what happens and hopefully train a smart AI to drive, uh, to fly a drone or to drive a car. I'm going to skip this whole architecture. Uh, there is, uh, inside this repo, there is an example of, with, uh, com uh, complete with code of how you can implement something called the DQN. We'll see about that in a bit, uh, using uh, CNTK. But you can find examples also of TensorFlow or other deep learning frameworks as well. Um, for games, this is a bit more fun. Uh, Project Mono is basically a add-on extension of Minecraft uh, that is able to <laughs> is able to uh, interact again with an agent. So it accepts uh, actions, it accepts commands, and is able to output new states and rewards for an agent uh, inside the game Minecraft. And then you can use that to train various reinforcement learning uh, model uh, agents. For example, this is uh, uh, an agent that is trying to learn how to cross a uh, bridge over lava without any other information except trial and error, basically. Okay, so uh, that's that's the agent. That's the environment. Sorry, uh, there are other environments available. But I've just run through a few. Now the agent. So the agent is basically a supposed to be our brain, right? <coughs> the agent learns to achieve goals by interacting with the environment. So basically the, the main agent group would be, uh, it would get from the environment a state that they are supposed to be in, and uh, a, pre a reward from the previous action, and then they would need to decide somehow on a specific action from that particular point in time, and they would select an action and push that to the environment. And then the environment will reply with the next state and some next reward and so on. So in order to formalize this a little bit, let's use our mountain car example from the beginning. Uh, in order to understand the problem a bit better, we need some notations, we need to understand some things that are happening in this interaction. So uh, we can define a time step. Usually reinforcement learning uh, problems can be continuous or episodic. I'm going to skip the details here. But basically we will have a sort of uh, time step where uh, we take actions as an agent and we, uh, as the environment, will reply with a uh, new state and a reward. Uh, we will have a state space, so we need some way to define how our world looks like, so what contribute, what uh, um, consists of, or, or what our world consists of. So in this example, we may have a state, a tuple of two val values, real values, a position and a speed. So we have a position of the cart and their speed, their current speed that they're going through, going at. Uh, beyond that, we, may have, we will have an action space, so this is a uh, sequence or a list of 
possible actions. So let's say for the sake of simplicity that we only have two possible actions in this, uh, in this problem, just pushing the car to the left or pushing the car to the right, one of two. Then we may have a reward structure. So we will always have some sort of reward structure. So maybe in this example, we will get 100 points whenever we reach that yellow flag over there. But we will get one minus one. So we'll get one subtracted one point for every time step where we don't actually reach the goal. And then we need something, <coughs> we will have something called a policy, which is basically the rule or law that governs the way our agent selects the next action. So for example, the simplest policy may be a greedy policy. So we would just say that whatever step we are in, just select the action with the maximum return or reward. But let's let's keep it with return right now. Okay, so let's just do a greedy policy and just select the action that will maximize our return. Okay, so what is what is return? Because I've just introduced a new term here, right? The return is basically a long-term accumulation of reward, right? Because we're an agent, we do something, we get one re reward. Uh, we're in a new state, we do something else, another reward, and so on, until either the episode ends or until we maybe reach the goal, right? So the long-term accumulation of reward is called a return. And there is some, uh, obviously, uh, infinite series there, potentially infinite. But uh, what we usually do in these types of problems is that we kind of discount future returns. So one way of uh, thinking about this is that we introduce a sort of discount factor called gamma, which is usually close to one, but not really one, just a little bit less than one, so that we give less weight or less importance to returns that are far in the future for various reasons. One reason might be the fact, to the fact that we actually want this to converge to some sort of maximum value. Okay. All right, so we have a return, and we can actually uh, express it uh, in a recursive way as well. Um, so let's introduce one last concept for this introduction uh, talk, introductory talk, uh, which would be the action value function. So the action, action value function, called Q, phi, uh, has two parameters, S and A, state and action. And the, Q, the action value function is basically the expected return, so the long-term accumulation of reward, uh, starting from state S, taking action A, and thereafter follows following the policy pi, the policy that we defined from the beginning. So as an example, maybe we're in this state, position one and speed one, and we may have this q pi, this, uh, this uh, action value function, uh, of this particular state and the action of pushing to the left. Maybe that value right now, as we have estimated it during our uh, interaction with the environment, is something like 21, right? And then, maybe q pi for the same state and pushing, to the, pushing the car to the right would be 26. So in this case, if we were to take, follow our greedy policy that we defined, we would, if we would end up in this state, we would choose to push the car to the right. Okay, so then one possible solution that this kind of action value function suggests is that if we were able to determine this function somehow and we were able to find out how its true values for S and A, combinations of S and A, then we can just follow our greedy policy, right? Whenever we get in a state, we look at the Q value for all the possible actions, we take the one with the most return, and we do that until we hopefully get to the goal. So we are supposed to be learning this function somehow, and this process is called QLearn, right? Because we're trying to learn the Q function. So having said that, if having introduced the Q action value function and Describe Q learning. I will take a short step back and say that Q learning is by no means the only way of doing reinforcement learning. Q learning, so basically, there are a spectrum of methods. Uh, some will focus on learning a specific value function. Q, the action value function, is by no means the only value function that you can use. Uh, some will focus, some uh, algorithms will focus, reinforcement learning algorithms will focus on learning the specific policy. So instead of just following the greedy policy, and maybe I just want to learn that. Or maybe even learn the model. The model is uh, basically the laws that govern the, the world, in a way. Don't have time to get into that. The reason I chose to focus on Q, uh, on the action value function and Q learning, is that while it is still, I think, simple enough to explain in the introductory talk, uh, it is still quite used. It has been responsible for some pretty amazing results, including the Atari uh, game breakthrough that I mentioned in the, in the paper the, a few slides ago. So it's a good starting point, I think. It's by no means you should stop at Q-learning, 
but uh, it's, it's a good uh, starting point into the world of reinforcement learning, I think. Okay, so without... Ooh. Okay, I need to go faster. <laughs> so the idea is how can we actually learn this function? So it turns out there is a very useful equation called the Bellman equation, which states that if our agent is in a specific state, takes an action, gets a reward, and a new state from the environment, then there is this formula that is able to tell the agent that they should update the uh, uh, the Q value for that specific state and taking the initial action as to the re reward that they just got for that step, plus the maximum possible value uh, of that Q function for the new state, uh, overall possible action from that new state, multiplied by that discount factor that we discussed. So instead of going through all the math, I've tried to visualize this in a way that may make more sense. So say that we are, say we say at some point during our training run, during our interactions with the environment, we have these estimations for this particular state, S prime, with a specific position and speed. So we think that at this point, the Q value of being in the state and pushing the car to the right is 21, and the state, the value of the Q value of being in the state and pushing to the right is 26. So just assume that somehow we arrive at these values. So maybe during the later during our training run, we find ourselves in this state S. So in this state, we choose to push the car to the right. So what will happen is then the environment will return a reward of minus one because we didn't reach the goal. And oops. And it's gonna, the car is going to end up in this state as prime. Right? So then what we can say is, well, if I was in this initial state, I pushed to the right, I got a minus one reward, and I got in a state where I think the best action value function is 26, then I could update my knowledge about the previous state to being something like 25, assuming that gamma is maybe like 1. Right? Why? Because I know that there is a way of pushing the cards to the right, uh, getting to a new state with an action value of 26, maximum action value of 26, and uh, I know it's going to cost me one reward point to get there. So this is a kind of uh, sim simplified version of the Bowman equation. Our environment here is deterministic, which means that basically there is no randomness to the world. Uh, if I'm in state S and I push to the right, I will always end up in state S prime. I'm just trying to keep things simple. But that's kind of the, what the Bowman equation says, right? So there is a way to continuously update the uh, uh, Q uh, value estimates for states and actions by interacting with the world and using the Bellman equation. So I could do that, right? So I could just have like a sort of table uh, with all possible combinations of states and actions, and into, by interacting with the uh, with the environment and by using the Bellman equation, I could update these values until hopefully it converges to the real values of Q, and then I could just follow my greedy policy, like I said, and just get to the get to the end. The problem is that most real-world problems aren't really like that. So even if you take, if you take, for example, our simple mountain car problem, our mountain car has uh, a state, the representation of state is made up by two real values, uh, position and speed. Right? These are real numbers. So even if our, in our very, very simple problem, the state space is infinite. So we can't really do table stuff. Okay? We need to find a better way or a more general way, in a way. Okay, so this leads me to the number one, to the, not, not number one, but the first challenge of reinforcement learning, which is one of representation. So, once we define what we're trying to do, we need to find a better way, or the best way possible, to represent our world to the agent. So this is an example of an Atari game, or two Atari games, rather, and we can choose to represent this game, this world, in two ways, for example. We can choose to represent for example, for Quant, we could use a sort of uh, real numbers of coordinates of ball and paddles, right? So we can have something like three times two, maybe we have like six variables in our state. Or we could just choose to represent it as a array of pixels, right? If you just give the uh, agent the entire image. So we have maybe 84 by 84, because that was the resolution of the Atari 2600, times 256 grayscale values, right? So both of these representations have advantages and disadvantages, right? This is much more compact, and it uses some information that we know about this particular game, 
right? So being more compact may mean that maybe we find a uh, model that is not as complex. So maybe it doesn't overfit, maybe it just trains faster, who knows? Whereas with this one, it's a bit more general because we can theoretically use this to, for any type of game that has a screen made of pixels, right? But then our state may be represented by a few tens of thousands of numbers. So maybe our model is more complex, maybe our model doesn't really, maybe our, uh, um, our choice of model basically may be more complex, may overfit, may not train as fast, maybe some other problems. Okay, so there's, that's one challenge. Uh, the other problem is generalization. So another challenge in reinforcement learning is how we actually generalize. So we already discussed about being uh, in, a st in a situation where the state space is infinite. For example, for the game of Go, the state space is not infinite. <coughs> because there is a theoretical maximum number of positions in Go. Unfortunately, that maximum number is larger than the number of atoms in the entire universe. And it's not even close, to be honest. It's like <laughs> huge difference, right? So even though the state space could be theoretically defined as finite, in practice, it's not. Uh, then we may have some other problems, like, for example, tr trying to build a, an autonomous, autonomous driver, whereas the states may only be partially observable. Right? So the agent might not be able to identify the entire uh, the entire surrounding is basically the whole values, the, uh, the values for all the possible parameters, variables that make the state, make up the state. Maybe some thing, some camera is obscure, maybe you don't see the traffic light, maybe there's something else happening, right? So inevitably, like in other types of machine learning problems, your agent, when, tried, when faced with the real world, it will encounter states that it has not seen during training. So it's, it has to be robust to these types of situations. So given those challenges, Maybe we can shift our aim a little bit. Instead, instead of trying to learn the exact values for all possible value uh, combinations of Q, maybe we can just approximate this function somehow, given our constraints that we have in terms of representation and generalization. Right? So we need to approximate the function. That sounds a lot like regression. Uh, that's many ways to do regression. But since there's a good chance that that Q fu uh, function will be quite complex, let's say that. Uh, why not use deep learning for this task? So why not have a deep neural network that will have one input layer with one neuron for each variable that make, that's part of the state, so one for position, one for speed. We have any number of intermediate layers, any number of architectures. And then at the other end, we'll have an output layer with a, an estimated Q value for that specific that particular state and each possible action. Right, so pushing to the left or pushing to the right. We're sticking to our mountain, mountain for example. Right, so how do we actually, first of all, how do we actually train this network? Right? So we remember that the agent interacts with the environment. And each of these interactions will start from a state, meaning that the agent takes an action, gets a reward, and a new state from the environment. So we can actually push this into a loss function that, using the Bellman equation, would tell us what the new estimated value of that Q, Q function should be like, should be, right? So, basically, we, once we, uh, we take an action and we experience a, result, a return and a new action, a new state, sorry, um, we are able to say, well, this value Q, this Q value of S prime, the new state, uh, should be, uh, like, like I said, 25, for example, right? And by going to a, on a forward path to the network, the network will tell us some different values because the network only knows what they have learned so far, right? So we have the basis for a loss function that we can then use to backpropagate on and update our knowledge of the network. So next time, we just tell the network, hey, so basically your estimate here is off by this amount. So use this to go back and learn from that. You gradient sent and all that. And uh, so you're better able to approximate a new value. Right? So this is what's called a deep Q neural network, also known as DQN, which is basically an application of deep learning to reinforcement learning. And 
Again, it was introduced in that paper discussing how you can actually, how they actually uh, learn to uh, teach talks an agent to play Atari games. And it was kind of a, although the details are no longer state of the art in reinforcement learning, they have, they are quite a significant breakthrough, I think. And it's good to, if you are able to understand how they work and what sorts of things they are capable of. Okay, so maybe we can have the basis, now we have the basis for our algorithm, right? Since we already have a network that can approximate uh, a function, then we can basically input, uh, we, we can have, uh, they can provide for us an estimated value for any type of state and action. Fair. Right? So we can do something like, we have a model, we initialize, with, initialize it with random weights, we just have an untrained network, and we're going to use a greedy policy, like I said. So then for a number of episodes, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, like my laptop was doing in the beginning, we do the agent loop. So first of all, we get a, an initial, uh, initialization position from the environment, so maybe they just place our mountain car at the beginning, at the middle position, and then we do what's called the agent loop. Right? So we can do something like we ask our policy to select an action, so just give us the greedy uh, action to take, push to the left or push to the right, and then we give that action to the environment, right? And the environment will reply with a reward and the index state. And they will also, also tell us if we're done or not for this particular episode. Maybe we reach the goal, maybe we are, I don't know, we just fall off the map, or maybe the maximum number of steps has been reached. So there is a way to end an episode uh, uh, for the environment. There is no way for the environment to end an episode. Right? And then we can actually use that pair, together with the Bellman equation, to push through our uh, network and learn, right? So we would do, for example, here, we would do a forward pass, we would compute the loss function uh, to the network, compute the loss function, and then we would do a backward pass with that loss function and update our network. And hopefully, if you keep doing that, our network will be able to approximate that Q function as good as possible. Uh, so then we can use it in, uh, in a real environment. Now, that's not enough, that's why I said that's kind of a naive uh, algorithm. There are some problems with that, uh, which I don't have time to get into. Uh, but there is an example, uh, this is actually what I've used as the basis for my little demo at the beginning. Um, there is an example of Q-learning on these environments, on the uh, OpenAI gene environments. Again, using CNTK, the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit. You will find examples with TensorFlow or other uh, frameworks as well. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about two more challenges. Ten minutes? Ten minutes is okay? It's ten, five. Okay, so the, the two challenges that I, I spoke about previously, uh, representation and generalizations, are challenges which are not unique to reinforcement learning. They are also present in supervised learning uh, problems. Uh, but the third one, exploration versus exploitation, is kind of unique to reinforcement learning, and it's one of the trickiest ones to get right. And this is kind of an example. Let's say that we have a, uh, an agent that's supposed to be maximum opening doors and collecting the, the amount of dollars behind those doors, and their job is to maximize the return, uh, the, the number of dollars that they get by doing this, so they can keep doing this for a number, uh, specific number of times. So maybe they just opened the first door, they got 10 bucks, they opened the second door, they got 5 bucks. Now the next, the question is what should be the next action? Should they try door number 3, with, which at this point has an unknown reward? Or should they just go back to the uh, door that they currently know has the best possible reward, which is the first one? So this is kind of the, this is the challenge of exploration, trying actions that may lead to uh, states that are uh, unexplored at this point, versus exploitation, which is basically going back to the what we know right now, what we think right now is the best possible action in this, in this state. Right? So the thing is, if you do just exploitation, if you just follow the greedy policy all the time, uh, it's likely that you, won't, you will be, probably get stuck in some sort of local maxima. Okay? Because you don't give your agent a chance to explore more and try states that may <coughs> actually lead to a better return over time. So this is kind of an example, uh, exemplification of what, uh, what happens when you get this trade-off between exploration and exploitation wrong. Uh, so this is what this uh, particular agent is supposed to be learning, to run as fast as possible. So the reward function is uh, built around 
uh, basically the faster they move forward, the more points they get. So this is what an optimal solution maybe would be. But here's what happened. What happened in a in another training run, <laughs> whereas the uh, agent figure out that they can just turn on their back, they still got reward because they were still moving forward, but they stopped exploring other possible, more better solution basically, and uh, yeah, that's kind of the result. So this is a tricky trade-off to get right. It will most likely take you many, many tries. Uh, one way to do this is basically to not use a greedy policy and use an epsilon greedy policy instead which basically introduces a epsilon, a, an exploration coefficient if you want, whereas at any time step uh, you choose a random number, say between 0 and 1, and if the random value is less than that epsilon, then you choose a random action as a way of exploring the state space more. Else, just choose the greedy action from that current, from that point, whatever you think is the best possible action, the best possible return. So usually this epsilon gets decayed over time, uh, so you may start with an epsilon of 1, so at the beginning I want my agent to explore as much as possible because I don't really trust my estimate of the Q value, so uh, it's probably no good, so I just want to explore as much as possible. But as my network, my DQN gets trained more and more, I get more and more confident into the estimations of the Q value that it provides, so I will just decay that exploration uh, coefficient and I will just focus more on exploitation of the solution. <coughs> I'm going to skip this. Last one, three minutes, I promise. Uh, the, uh, the last challenge, uh, which is also particular to reinforcement learning, is the design of the reward function, uh, which is kind of, uh, it's also called, known as the Cobra effect. This stems from a story of the, during the British Raj, which was the British administration of India. Uh, so basically what happened, it was basically in the, the 1800s, there was a, the 1900s, rather, early, 1900s, uh, there were a lot of cobras in the wild, and as a, and as a result, uh, people would get bit by cobras and they would die. So the government, the British government, decided that they are going to offer a reward for people who are bringing in dead cobras, right, as a way of calling down the population of wild cobras. So it didn't take long for some enterprising individuals figured out that they could just breed cobras, right, because they could, you could just breed them and then kill them and go to the government, collect the reward, and it's a lot safer and more lucrative than just going out into the jungle and hoping to spot a cobra before they spot you. So when the government realized this, they put an end to the reward program, which caused those cobra breeders to release the cobras in the wild. So the <laughs> end result was that they ended up with more cobras than they started with. So it's not actually clear if, it, if it's a real story, if it's just a fairy tale, but the Cobra Effect uh, name kind of stuck, uh, and basically uh, showcases one important truth in reinforcement learning. Learning is that you get what you incentivize, you don't necessarily get what you intend. So here's an example from the robotic control. Uh, so basically this robot is supposed to be learning to take the uh, red cube and place it on top of the uh, blue cube. Uh, unfortunately the reward function is designed so uh, first, the reward function was just a um, measure of the z value of the red cube, of the bottom of the red cube. So they would just pick it up and fling it in the air. Then they figured out that uh, that was not good, and they just only offered the reward when the cube was stationary. Unfortunately, since the uh, reward is still dependent on the z value of the bottom of the cube, the robot just figured out that they can just flip over the cube, right? Instead of just placing on top of the the uh, blue cube over there. Okay. So. Yeah, uh, how you shape your reward function is crucial. Um, and you may actually decide to have a shape reward rather than a sparse reward. So if you remember my mountain car example, that was an example of a sparse reward. I only gave plus 100 when my agent reached the top. And that has its own problems, right? It's more objective, is that I only reward what I intend, so I don't get into those cobra effects type of situations when I give partial rewards for things that I may not intend. Uh, but at the other end, you have an, an issue with uh, allocation, allocating rewards. So, for example, let's say that my cart, my agent pushes the cart for 20 time steps, and they reach the top and they get 100 points. Which of those 20 actions that they took, pushing to the left, to the right, 
were beneficial to the indie to get into the uh, reward, and which were not beneficial. It's not easy to allocate that long-term return <coughs> to specific actions that took place many, many steps before that. Okay, so I will end here. Uh, I'm really sorry for going over time, but this is kind of a first view, hopefully, for uh, things like reinforcement learning. These are the main reinforcement learning challenges. Uh, if you want to get started, you can go for the OpenAI gym and start working on problems. Um, in the real world, there are many, many applications, like I said, uh, in, including things that we didn't discuss, for example, network security, active network security, or uh, financial trading. Um, the real world has a couple more uh, real challenges in addition to the ones that I mentioned. Uh, in the real world, maybe quite expensive to acquire new experience or to train an agent in, the, in a very, very real world scenario. So usually these types of problems start with simulated environments, but at some point you have to move to the real world. So the cost of acquiring experience and the cost of failing at your actions uh, may be much larger in real world problems. Okay, thank you.